All right, so this video has been three days in the making. I keep getting to that moment right before I hit record. And you start talking, and the silence is just absolutely crushing. So, what's going on is that we're testing Quantum Hands, a tabletop system that I've made myself. And I found one tester. I had seven people tell me they were interested, and ultimately one person showed up, which great return rate. So Firestat has graciously agreed to let us use his game as an example and talk about what rules worked, what didn't, a little behind the scenes like DMing type information stuff. So the session took five hours. There's a lot to cover here. It's going to be a long video. So I'm going to be reading through the chat log because we played by text, not line by line. I'm not going to read you every single line, but I am going to go through uh, for my own benefit to just kind of read through. I fully intend to put up some graphical representations that will help you uh, keep track of what's happening, but we played through text with no additional materials, so should be easy enough to follow. Uh, the character that Firestat was playing is called Walther Wolfram. He was a human using the old racials resourceful and greedy. He chose the tags Traveler, Collector, and Historian. His words were Solve, Parkour, Appraise. His inventory had some stuff. His weapons were throwing knives and a bow. Staff, not the not the people. Um, and then his armor was cloth. So just one. Uh, he did not include the nimble tag, so we forgot it. I thought about it at the time. But as he didn't include it, I thought maybe he was doing a stylized thing. The characters seem to be something like Indiana Jones. I'm not sure if that was the intention or if it's one of those what I made with the DM saw sort of things. But I went in with the understanding that he was Indiana Jones. So the quest that he accepted was to retrieve a glowing crystal from the old town. Just a little bit of setting, a little bit of lore here. But Nezbereth is the mass of human settlement, and they rely on glowing crystals to keep the monsters at bay. When the town was started, it was in the old town. Then they found the crystals. Now they have Nezbereth. Old town is infested with monsters. Nezbereth is not. Old town is abandoned, ruins, monsters everywhere, right outside the city. So, uh, Indy's job was to go into old town, find the mine, get some glowing crystals, bring them back, and the reward would be one guild coin and a truth. Now, as Indy is a traveler collector historian, right, that truth could be from the aviary who are collectors of knowledge. So you could have any question answered about the lore, about the world, about anything. And uh, we'll get to that later, what he chose. So... Let's get into the chat log. <sighs> right, so creating the deck is the very first step. And this is where each player submits five to ten words. And we put them all together and we shuffle them. And those are going to be used throughout the game. So anytime you get the last hit on a monster, or you success fully successfully complete a skill check, you draw a card, and that, uh, that gives you a word temporarily. So he did have some trouble thinking of words. So I seeded the deck with the words uh, electric, leap, longing, slash, and trap. And he provided mislead, vanish, skip, fire, and move. So one of these is a homonym, right? Fire. Really a few of them are, but fire I made them uh, specify between uh, firing a bow or like the element fire, right? Because certain words would just be Silly if you could use it both ways. So that was the only one that we specified. And uh, from there, we, uh, we dove in. So <laughs> I guess I'll read my DM parts. Maybe they'll make it into the video, maybe they won't. Uh, so as you finish reading the flyer, the initial morning crowd at the Adventurer's Guild begins to dissipate. Nobody left to recruit. The job you've taken was posted by the aviary itself. They're willing to trade one truth and one guild coin for every glowing crystal that is recovered from the old town mines. Are there any preparations you'd like to make before heading to the old town, just outside the city walls? So, 
I was actually totally unprepared for him to prepare things. I had not prepared anything in the town. I had only done a loose sketch of the old town itself and of Nesbareth. And the, even the mine itself is hardly a doodle. And I'll show, you, I'll show you the notes when we're done so you can see like just how freeform we were going. So he decides that he wants to check maps. He wants to find some maps of the old town to figure out exactly where he's going, figure out the route, make sure that he has a plan, and also ask around if there are rumors of bandits, um, either along the route or in the town itself. And at this point, I had failed to communicate that the town was like literally right up against them, like touching, like a wall between them. Uh, so he looks over the maps and I describe the layout of the old town mine. And basically it's the battle board and then an additional ring and it's ruins. And the old town mine is at the North end. Nesbareth is at the South end. I tell him that there are rumors of both demons and bandits in the old town. Lots of sightings of lots of bad things. So normally the area is off limits without an official writ, but you just happen to have one from the guild. So I ask him if there's anything else he'd like to gather information on. And he says, you know what? Let's see if we can get some information about these demons. Because that sounds spooky. He asks if there's any recent sighting. He rolls some dice. He succeeds. You, and mind you, I have not prepared any of this. I don't, like, I don't know if there's any sightings. So he finds a guy in the guild boasting about a goblin. And this guy, <laughs> in my head he was Nautsku from <laughs> Log Horizon. Don't know why. Uh... And so he's talking about, like, this goblin that led him into a trap and a crossbow bolt is still sticking out of his shin. And his party, like, had to pull him out, and he's, like, laughing about it, like, oh, man, those goblins, you know how they are. And so they have a little back and forth, and they talk about goblins. And in this moment, Firestat is forced to develop his character a little bit, a little tiny bit, because I start to call him old-timer, I realize I don't know how old this character is in relation to my Natsuko, right? Fire sets that? He's about this old, right? And that further solidifies it for both of us. Maybe he already understood, but I did not. So they go back and forth, and he just talks about lots of goblins in the town because he's been down in there. And uh, Firestat wishes him well. He decides that's enough information he's going to head into the old town. Let's skip ahead here. Well, you exit the city gate, the glow of the many crystals, and the portcullis slams behind you. Before you lies a wasteland, plaster and wood ruins of a town once vibrant. Even the trees have withered to stalks. A rough cobbled path curves around the left and right. A straight path leads into a T-section alley. So I had described the layout when he looked at the maps, but I was not going to let him just say, oh, I go to the north. I was going to make him do it intersection by intersection, make sure that he understood the layout and was navigating it in character. He takes the cobbled path to the left, which, again, because it's a big circle, you can just go around circle. No biggie. He wants to stealth around the left. So we do a little stealth check. And he says, I want to listen in on the sound of goblins. I'll use leap to get up to a vantage point to try to figure out what they're doing. In quantum hands, one of the things you can do is use a word to enhance a skill check uh, with like a minor magical effect. So this is a great example. In leaping, normally a person could leap, what, like two feet off the ground? Like not that high? Um, but with leap, the word, he was able to leap up to a rooftop. Um, that was actually a perfect usage of a word to enhance a skill check. One of the rules is that if you use the exact word for the thing you're trying to do. Not like kind of, sort of, included in it, right? So sleight of hand for steel would not be a one-to-one, -one, right? This would be too broad to cover this exact thing. But in this case, he's leaping and he's leaping, so he gets plus one to one of his skill dice. So the DC was set at five. He gets to roll 2d6 because he used a word. And so he gets a four and a three. Uh, that would fail, right? Because neither of those is higher than five. But because he's leaping and he's leaping, it's plus one. So he got the five, he made it through, he succeeded in his leap, he got where he was going. You take a deep breath and launch yourself up to the nearest rooftop. 
This building overlooks the T intersection, the next row of ruined buildings, and the inner streets. Roll a perception. So at this point, I had roughly mapped out the old town, but I didn't have a plan for every street in the old town. I knew that goblins were in the old town. I knew that bad stuff was in the old town. I've prepped maybe 10 quests at this point, right? Just loosely, not like moment by moment. In prepping those 10 quests, I've fleshed out what is the old town, who lives in the old town, what factions are at play here, what's the overall thing that is happening in this region across these 10 quests, right? He does a spot, and he sees crossbow bolts flying out of this window, striking this lesser ruined building in the center of town. It looks like it's been patched up over time. There's smoke coming out the chimney. It looks inhabited, right? And there are very clearly goblins in, in a building between him and this, this better building, uh, just shooting crossbow bolts at it, just harassing this building, laughing, giggling, and doing goblin things, right? So our hero, Wolf, Wolfram Walther Wolfram uh, decides that he's, he's not going to get involved in that. None of his business. That is not why he's here. He has to get to the mine. So he just continues around the circle up to the north via the rooftops. So this is interesting. It would take a skill check each time you go up and down the building right? because you have to cross the intersection. He has a grappling hook, which probably could have saved him a leap in the first place but he uh decides he's gonna just up and down up and down to maintain its stealth as he's going through this place he does not want to mess with any goblins so he's communicated i don't want to mess with any goblins and there's this super tedious thing we could do with the skill checks but that's stupid right it doesn't push the narrative forward so we do one skill check for the entire trek he passes half of it Based on the map you perused previously, you know that this will be a problem for every block of the city. Six blocks of the mine, time consuming, but also totally fine. So he says, <clears throat> staying glued to the rooftops is safer than just walking on the street level. I've already seen what happens when you walk down the expected paths. The guy took an arrow to the shin. Let's take what time we need to get to the mine safely. So in quantum hands, time is valuable because the way that i design adventures is time-based based on way the samurai right so if you can get to the mine in three hours it gives you more options than if you get there in six hours now for this particular adventure i didn't i didn't plan a time because it's just a straight up dungeon crawl but there's something to be said for passing or failing a skill check uh, affecting the time that something takes so I say, give me a general stealth check, and we'll use it for the entirety. And this is a 2d6 skill check, because it is such a, a wide thing, right? It's six checks in one. And so he rolls a three. The difficulty is 3-3. Three, three. He rolls a three. There's no way that he can pass this check 100%, right? He can partially pass it, but he can't fully pass it. So what do we do? We decide that it takes more time. Right? The second failed is time. He would have got there real quick if he used a word and managed to get there free. Some close calls along the way, but you managed to reach the mine around sundown. What information you gathered along the way is that there are gobs of goblins in this town. It is unlikely that you could face any one squad of them alone. I designed all the quests with three players in mind, which is one less than the party max. Firestat, hero that he is, decided to take this one on alone. So I knew that any of the goblin encounters I've designed are likely to wipe him. I didn't want that. So I don't leave the goblins alone. Like, it's good decision making. I was reinforcing the decision that he already made, which is that goblins are spooky. The mouth of the mine is smeared with bloody drag marks. It is clear that you've come to the right place. The sun is setting and no light emanates from within. Railcart tracks lead the way. So the way that this is set up is that you enter into a chamber, and there are three paths. One goes to the right and then snakes off. One goes to the left and then snakes off. And the one that would be forward 
as caved in. To the left are minecart tracks, and to the right is just a path that looks totally undisturbed. So our hero, Firestorm, takes the only path, not the only path that he could, but he chooses the left path. And he wants to take out his lantern, shine some light, and he wants to use his bow to kind of like scrape the ground looking for traps. He's very concerned about getting trapped. So... You cautiously scrape your staff ahead and make your way into the mine. You now see that the glints of metal are the shattered remnants of weapons and armor, littering the pile of bones that have accumulated in the entryway. You see what used to be three distinct tunnels, left, forward, and right. The forward path has caved in and it seems unlikely you'll be able to pass. The minecart tracks snake around the left along with the drag marks. The right path seems undisturbed in ages. At this point, Indiana Jones decides he's going to use a tag. Now, tags work a lot like words. They do the exact same thing as words for skill checks. So he has the historian tag. And what he's going to do is try to recall information regarding the structural integrity of this cave when it was still in use. So he wants to know if this is like a proper mining operation or if it's kind of like bootleg tunnel stuff. And because tags are not consumed, he's able to get that bonus anytime he's doing historian stuff. He can get plus 1d6 to his role. You know that Old Town was the working settlement of a research team. They were professionals who knew what they were doing. Anywhere there's a minecart is almost assured to be safe from collapse. So he's still scraping along. Scraping along. You begin down the left path, but you can hear familiar deathly groans. You've encountered zombies before. You know what's in store, just around the corner. So, the way that the Wolf... Walther Wolf... Walther Wolfram? Was described. <clears throat> Sounds like he's been out and about before. When we talked to Natsuko, he kind of referenced previous adventures. I don't know if he was bluffing or if it was the real thing. But I decided for him that he's faced zombies before. Now... A lot, a lot of role players would have a big problem with this. I'm really glad the fire stat was able to just roll with it. Because it's no big deal to be like, actually, I haven't I ever seen it. Uh, and it's a huge benefit when like details that could be part of your backstory just kind of pop up while you're playing. So I think it's risky for the DM to make these assertions and also entirely worth it in a lot of cases. I try to keep it to things that make sense for the backstory. Um, as this is just like a test character that I don't think Firestep put a ton of time into, I thought it'd be okay. And I'm glad I went with it. Maybe he'll hit me up with comments later saying, no, that was awful. But as far as I know, it, it worked fine. So he asked me just a single path forward and backwards, right? And it's going to be a recurring theme. Because he knows he's on rails. I know he's on rails. There's a literal railroad, right? Like, I could not have been more clear that he's on rails. Um, which is kind of the nature of the quest board, right? Because you're not playing an established character in a campaign that can kind of do whatever they want in the world. You're taking a specific quest with a specific goal. Like, I'm going to go get the, the glowing crystal from the old time mine is different than I'm going to go pursue my own ends and there happens to be an old town line. Um, I hope to get into some campaigns eventually. But right now I, I've got one tester showing up for these, these throwaway games, right? Says, okay, I'm going to put away the staff and peer around the corner to see how many zombos are there. They give me stealth. 2DC. He rolls a 4. That means he gets a word because he fully succeeded the total number of dice. So he gets a word from the deck as a response. Now I randomly draw that. Give it to him. In this case, it was vanish. The words he has right now are skip, trap, solve, appraise, parkour, and vanish. Those are the words you can use to cast spells and to do skill checks. Uh, some of those are from character creation. Some of those are temporary, but that's what he's got. So you peer around the corner and see two zombified miners lazily scratching at a wall with their hands. They shamble about aimlessly. 
So he says, I'm going to combine trap and skip to make a sigil that will teleport whoever crosses it to a different locale. Now, this works conceptually, right? Like, there's no reason you can't draw a sigil to do that with the words trap and skip. But one of the requirements for magic is additional words to do additional things. And so to a different locale has to either be a place you can see, right? Or you need a word, right? You could do like distant skip trap would be fine for poofing them away. But you, you need more words to cast bigger magic. So he says, eh, well, I don't think I'm going to do that. And he wants to clarify. He says, quick question before I proceed, though. They're clawing at a wall, right? Is there anything up that wall? I, spe I clarify that the wall is just dirt tunnel that's been scratched out. It's not like a manufactured wall. He says, okay, I'll use skip and vanish to flash step over to the other side of the tunnel. So it's two words. Of course you can teleport to the other side of a room with two words. Stealthily so. So skip and vanish are gone. He doesn't have access to those anymore. Now this is the first big thing that I had specifically put in for this character that he missed. As you begin weaving the fates for your flash step, you notice the black stone outline and rubble of the exit tunnel. An inscription on both faintly glows blue, its intensity matching yours. You flash step past the zombies and are safe inside the next tunnel. So this was actually the lore of the old town line. If he had not skipped the zombies and instead inspected that stone, he would find that it was like a, an ancient text, which is in line with this character, what he's into. And there's information about the cave that could lead to other quests, could be useful in other quests. Not actually useful for this quest, but it's part of the environmental storytelling that uh, I was hoping would kind of hook his character in a little bit more. The same thing with the right path at the beginning of the mine. It explains why there are minecart tracks this way and not the other way. It explains the fragments of the stone on the ground. It explains why they glow, and all that is hidden behind uh, basically history checks, right? <laughs> I put them in specifically for this character, and he just skipped them entirely, which is fine. It's not a fault. It's just a fact that could come up later, right? If somebody else comes into this mine for some other quest, they will also have the opportunity to decipher these stones and figure out what used to live here. This tunnel is far more narrow, hardly enough space for just the minecart tracks that continue. He continues looking with, for <laughs> traps with the staff, and generally I, generally I do not do traps. And I understand he was warned about goblins and traps um, in town. And that's just kind of a, a reality of the ad hoc not planning that I did, is that I know that there are goblins in Old Town, and I know that goblins use traps. So when he met a guy who had been to the Old Town, he heard about goblins. Now, I also know that the Old Town Mine has virtually nothing to do with goblins. Uh, so it's reasonable for him to be so worried about traps. But at no point will it actually pop up. Nothing will come up. Just because it doesn't make any sense for the design of the area. Also, maybe I'm a bad DM. Who knows? You do your best to scrape for traps, but this tunnel is truly confining. You stumble out into a more open chain. This area has rough stone floors that are covered in dust. Torches line the walls, and you can see freely. Once more, paths branch to the left and right. Like I said, something used to live here. And traveling through that broken stone on the cart tracks, uh, he now comes into the manufactured stone area, right? Like, this is a proper home of something. So he, he now wants to take a look at the walls and for any markings of the past documents. Now he's starting to kind of dig into it. Um, now that there are no enemies here, but can't just give it to him for free, right? Uh, at this point, I roll 1d6 for the difficulty of figuring out some stuff on the walls. And it was at this moment that I realized that a 1d6 actually can't be failed. Um, and that does not feel super satisfying right it doesn't feel 
worth doing a roll for, and I don't really know how to resolve it. I'm kind of totally fine with it, but it's just anticlimactic for the player when you're like, oh, let me roll difficulty, and it's a one, it's like, me, auto success, you know, no matter what. Um, that's something I'd like to look at more. I'm not sure what to do with it. So he rolls a five, passes it, and he gets the word mislead. You see tattered tapestries and a rough wooden furniture. It appears some primitive life once occupied this space. You note that the red dyes of the tapestry are 100% definitely blood. So we've got these tapestries of something fighting a bull or a minotaur or some great bull-like creature, right? And they're just these tattered, ripped tapestries all along the walls kind of telling a story. Um, you can't really make it out because they're tattered and ripped and all that sort of thing. So he does at some point decide to collect some of these. Also, I should have mentioned the ceilings of this area are much higher. They're proper rooms that stand maybe two times your height. Let's look around the furniture for anything useful. So I described some wood tables. I wasn't really prepared with like specific goods for these rooms. I knew a couple of loot items that exist that, again, he'll just have a bypass entirely. A dim yellow light peeks out from the left path and then just as quickly goes away. So he starts going down the left path because, like a moth to a flame, Firestat approaches death. So you hear the repetitious clotting of footsteps. The light has a routine to it. Eventually, you identify that it's a zombie with a glowing miner's cap. There are two of them patrolling in circles around the next room. Now, when I said patrolling, I just meant, like, meandering in a circle, right? But what he heard was, like, patrolling. So, he's like, patrolling. That's not a good sign. He, he thought it was, like, a lot more serious than it actually was says, okay, as useful as that miner's helmet would be, I don't know if it's worth potentially alerting whoever is controlling these zombies to patrol the area. I'm returning to the previous room and heading down the other path. So, just due to my description, uh, poor description, I think I spooked him off of this very easy combat. Undead are very weak. They get one action per round instead of two. And they've got like 3 HP, no armor. Like, you could bop an undead. You could bop two undead. But I made it sound spookier than it was. This is where we talk about the tapestries and the bull. And he's like, I'm going to take some of those masks. No blood stains. If not, we're taking some. The dye is blood. What do you want from me, right? So he collects some of those. To the right, the formed stone meets an abrupt end with an obvious cave-in blocking the path. It is unlikely you'll be able to continue in that direction. The path you're on snakes ahead and you can smell the scent of blood. Lots of blood. So he's on the other side of the cave in there. And that really is just meant to give him some sense of the map. Like he has snaked around to the same spot. So at this point, I, I felt weird throwing more undead. Um, I kind of wanted to use this as a tutorial on the presence of demon spawn. So in the world of, in the test world of quantum hands, there are demons that emerge from condition. So like, let's say there is super sad, grieving woman. She becomes, uh, it's called a Kaya, but anyway, a screaming demon, right? Like a Banshee. Um, if that Banshee exists over time, demon spawn will begin to appear around her. So goblins and undead are two types of demon spawn. They can be found together. They can be, you know, there might be bats. Like, it's not that goblins are a race. Goblins are a demon spawn that will be found interspersed with other things. And if you see these things, it is an indication that there is a demon nearby. I don't think this quest got that, got that information to Firestat, but it was the first kind of bite of the apple of like, okay, these are the things that are found in the world. You step into the next room to find three goblins. One stands over a butcher table, meat included. The other two crouch in the far corner, seemingly gambling for something. The path continues on the far side of this den of evil. 
just to lay it out. You're in the tunnel, peeking around, doing your little little bow staff, little bow staff shimmy, right? And you see two goblins on the far side of the room. They're on the ground. They're you know rolling dice or whatever. Their backs are turned. On the right side of the room is a big, rough-hewn wooden table, and a goblin standing over it, chopping some meat, right? And Firestat decides, this is time for some magic. I'll use magic again. Trap and mislead. I'd like, to take some so- I'd like to make some sort of trap that when triggered will leave them in some kind of stupor. Actually, a trap will make them believe that the others are out to get them. Because, okay, where are you going to scratch that sigil? Now, as this is starting to sound like he's going to fight these guys, I ask him, you know, like, are we combating? He says, we might be. Now, because the relationship between the goblins begins to matter, time starts to matter, right? Do you go? Do I go? How long are these goblins just standing here? And if you do happen to trap one, then what, you know, how far from the other goblins is he? It's a whole thing. So I decide to introduce the battle board for the very first time in this whole adventure. 40 minutes into just describing it to you, much less playing it through text. Okay, so we've got the battle board, and we've got he, Firestat, is in C3. We've got goblins in D1, D8, and D3. He says, I'll scratch the sigil along the wall. Then I'll move backwards and make a noise to draw the attention of one of them over to the trap. So he heads back into the hall, and he's like making noise, you know, bang, bang, bang. He says, we can use the old pickaxe to make a noise. As soon as you make your sound, you can hear the collective guan from the room beyond. It's the butcher who takes the bait. He shrieks in incredulity. He is aggroed, but it won't last long. So he makes a noise. The butcher's coming down the hall. The butcher springs the trap. He's enraged, thinking that his allies are out to get him. And he turns around. He's like, Arr! he's going to go in. So while the butcher is approaching his comrades, Firestad says, pop back in and use a throwing knife to throw at one of the gobbos. This is where we start getting into the battle board layout. So I say, if you're going to go back in, we're going to roll initiative. Uh, so he rolls 1d6, I roll 1d6, and the higher number, that team goes first. So they got a 3, he got a 4. So we lay it out so that he's in C3. The goblins are in D8 and D1. The butcher is in C1, running to attack his allies. But Firestat goes first because he rolled 4. I believe this is not technically rules as written currently. I think he should have gotten a surprise round. But I kind of consider the whole sigil thing to be a surprise round. So he wants to throw a knife. Now, the way that ranged attacks work in Quantum Hand is that you can't do it adjacently on the same ring. You use movement rules to count the distance, and the first two are free. So he's trying to throw from C3 into D8. Now that means we cross into C4, that's one. And then we cross into D8, which is two. And we round up. So for every two beyond the first, your hit die increases. So it starts at 1D6. And due to the distance, it gets bumped up to D8. It's just the hit die, not the damage die. So what he's going to do is he's going to roll that hit die, a D8 in this case. And the resulting number is going to tell us where he hits target. One through four are head, main hand, legs, and off. Five, six, seven are misses. Eight is a crit. He gets to choose a hit zone. This usually doesn't matter. Uh, grunt enemies, just random enemies, not bosses, not fate weavers. Um, when they get a body part maimed, when they get to zero on any body part, they're down. They're gone. They're dead. So there are some reasons you would want to crit and then choose a specific zone depending on the scenario, right? If you're fighting, let's say, a lich, right? and his amulet is hit zone 5. You land that 8, you'll be like, I'm going to hit the amulet, right? So it'll come up more later. It doesn't really 
matter that much in this particular adventure. All right, so he rolls a two on the goblin indeed. And so that's going to be a main hand hit. He rolls 1d4 for damage, because that's just kind of the standard range damage right now. I'm not really sure what to do with it. It's still tweaking. He rolls a three for an unarmored goblin is enough to take out an arm because combat in quantum hands is very much a numbers thing. So you're going to fight 10 goblins. Each one's going to go down with one hit, but you're also going to go down with one hit. It's very high stakes. Every single hit matters a lot. Uh, hitting a goblin in the arm for three with a throwing knife is like the knife goes through the arm. This guy can't fight. This guy's done. When you get the last hit on an enemy, you draw a word. In this case, he gets longing. So then he also wants to move, so he moves over to B2. He says, wait, changing rings takes a turn to do. I say, sure, but you can use your last action of this round and your first action of next round to move between rounds. There's just a chance that you get interrupted. Not a big deal, but you're able to do that. And I want that to be a thing because it maintains the narrative idea that everything's in flux everything's happening as things are going so there are two round actions that just bridge across like okay so next up is the butcher he performs a diving angry slash with his cleaver against his goblin pal he completely sweeps the leg another one down so i just rolled all the goblin stuff myself and then i just narrated the outcome but he did hit the leg zone for like four so at this point, he's trying to attack the Butcher, the Goblin in C1. So he says, a D8 to hit, right? No, because you can move on the same ring. It only costs two, and the first two are free. Your hit die does not go up. It's just 1D6. So he rolls a four. The four is the offhand. He does four damage. That's enough to take out a Goblin. These Goblins. So I'm like, oh, man, how great. You get the word electric. Now, when we chose the words for the deck, we did not, well, I did not, try to think of words that would work well together to create specific effects. I literally just took the first 10 words off the top of my head and jammed them in the deck, which is how I think you should do it. Because finding the weird uses for all the words and like trying to make them apply to what's going on and to each other is the fun part. So it's a lot more interesting if you don't think about ahead of time how things will be useful, and you just kind of dive in and start using things. Okay, so he's taken out three goblins in, what, one, two rounds? Um, he kind of bedazzled one who went and took out his friend. He knifed the other, right? And then he chopped the, the butcher. It's a very cinematic, very... I think it feels good. <laughs> You'd have to ask Firestat. He didn't give a ton of feedback, but... Uh, I think it feels great to just take out three goblins because it's not like you're just taking out three goblins. I'm king of the world power fantasy. It's like if those goblins hit you, they're going to take you out just as fast. And uh, I think that's great. Okay, so he's killed three goblins. He's got the word electric and he decides he wants to hide the bodies. Um, I am obviously unprepared for this reality. Like, where is he going to hide bodies in a, in a railroad, right? So I say, oh, there's a barrel of meat. You could just stuff them in there. So he does. <laughs> and then he's like, okay, let's move on quietly. Now, in this room, the thing that the goblins were gambling over were shards of glowing crystal. This was meant to be um, a form of the relic that... Walther could keep specifically for himself to lead into things in the future, but he was in such a hurry to get out of this room that like, I guess we'll just move on. And some people find that unsatisfying. They'll be like, well, you should have told me. I would have noticed. But like, in the moment, you, you're in a hurry. You appear to not have any interest in searching this room. Um, so I let it go. Maybe it was the wrong thing to do. Maybe it was the right thing to do. I don't know. This is a noise unlike anything you've heard before. It echoes not only in the walls, but under your skin. It takes a moment to fully realize, but this is the sound of bone scraping on stone. Not one bone on one stone, 
but a hundred times at once. Whatever made this sound, you know it's not good. So, a very loud sound is in the next chain. And he just wants to confirm. It's still just a one-way tunnel, though, right? Like, no option here. Gotta go in there. Uh, he tries to determine if the sound is approaching him. It's too loud. It's too creepy. It's not going anywhere. It just is the entire area. In the next chamber, you see a room. More of a home smashed to pieces. The rough wooden bed is splintered in two. A chandelier torn from the ceiling. Braziers toppled. Tapestries torn. Bones filling every corner to your height. Amongst them glows the same blue as the Nesbereth crystals. So we know that the crystals are in this pile of bones. I don't believe at this point Firestat knows what it is. I think he knows that there's probably a boss here, but I, I don't think it's all come together yet. Maybe it has. I'm quite predictable. Can I see the source of the sounds? Well, 1d6. I got a 2, he got a 6. Uh, he gets the word moon. Your brain puts the pattern together before your eyes. Some bones amongst the pile slowly shuffle as one. Something hides within the bones. Now, the reason I don't think he knew what was coming is because of his next action. He says, I'm hiding behind a bone pile and picking up a small bone then throwing it towards the other side of the room, preferably towards an exit or entrance. As you approach the bone pile, it flicks out and strikes you. The demon has revealed itself. A giant room-sized centipede born of many corpses within this cave. Your offhand cloth armor is destroyed. Roll initiative. So the boss is modeled after the centipede boss in Neo, but instead of rocks, it's bone. That's the long and short of it. He's going to charge around, try to grab him, and he's going to have bone armor while he does it. So because he went and touched the bone, I gave the boss an attack surprise round, right? Which is this uh, attack that hit his offhand armor and destroyed it. Now his armor has one armor, right? He's wearing cloth. But the way that armor works in quantum hands is that any excess damage is discarded when it breaks. So if you have one cloth armor on your offhand and you take 30 damage, that armor is destroyed, your arm's fine. Now the next hit, for 30 would explode your arm, but in this way, pretty much anyone can tank anything once. And the number of hits you get before something destroys is quite significant. So if you have a plate mail helmet that has six durability, and you get stabbed in the face for five, you have one left, it's not that spooky, because you could still take one five damage hit to the head and be totally fine. But after that, you're very aware, like, okay, I'm out of free hits. I am exposed. I am in danger. Uh, a little back and forth, we get initiative rolled. He rolls five. I roll four. He's got to make a save to see if he is shook, which would prevent him from moving. So that is a feature of the body slam of the boss. Now, when did I decide that shook would be a thing that is actually in my notes surprisingly the hiding of the bones was not in my notes the boss being in this room was not in my notes the running around the room that he's gonna do not in my notes all i knew is that there was a centipede of bones somewhere in this mine and then i was going to use him as a character uh, as appropriate to fill out the space which is just kind of how i design adventures like the goblins. I didn't plan a butcher goblin. I didn't plan three goblins. Um, I just, I had goblins and I had a space. And I brought them together. So that is a lazy way of DMing. It also works for these throwaway quests. It's great. Fails to save. He can act. He just can't move. Right? He's shook. He's kind of off balance. So he's going to strike it with his bow staff. His staff staff. So, because it's a two-hand weapon, it's going to be 1d8 hit die, 1d10 damage. Now, these two numbers are not related in any way. The hit die is based on the accuracy of the weapon. So, a uh, one-hand weapon is 1d6, and 
a two-hand weapon is 1d8. What that means is that the one-hand weapon can generally only miss on a five. One number. Uh, the 1d8 can miss on a five, six, or seven. So it's wildly less accurate. But dealing 1d10 damage is kind of a big deal. Because that will one-shot more likely. Most armors, most body parts, it will... It can create damage that you can't resist uh, interruption-wise. Like if you're in the middle of a movement and you take damage, the amount that you have to roll is based on the damage you took. With a d6, so if you just do 7 damage, they can't resist it. Like, d d10 is a lot of damage. It might actually be too much damage, as we'll find out a little later. So, he rolls a 7, which is just a whiff. No good, can't move, missed his attack. This boss fight is off smashingly. The demon shakes his body out of the bones and circles the room behind you. You can now see that he is made of bones. Every leg a sharpened piece of some fallen hero. He moves his head to d7 and his body to d8. Did I plan for this boss to take up two spaces? I did not. But I needed to create a sense of directionality. Because I, at this point, at this moment, I decided he was going to charge around the room like this and just kind of be a general pain in the ass. So, I decided he's going to take up two spaces. Now, how does that work with hit zones? Because one's the head and, and the rest are, you know? So, what I decided was that if he hit one, two, three, four on the head, just do head damage, and if he hit one, two, three, four on the body, we just apply it to body because he's a centipede. He's got a bunch of zones. And it's just kind of how that worked out. It was very in the moment loosey goosey. Again, maybe not satisfying after the fact, but it worked at the time. So, his head is in D7, his body is in D8. So, fire stat is going to move to D3 and throw a dagger. He's going to throw it at the tail, roll a two. So, because it's that one through four, and I'm not trying to penalize him on accuracy, so I'm going to let him use all four hit zones. Uh, he rolls two damage? Great. So, this is the first armored enemy that Firestat is encountering. This is the first time that his attacks are not actually going to one-shot something and not get him anywhere. So, the knife skids across the surface of his bony exterior. You're not even sure he felt that. His armor is threes in all zones, and his HP is eight in all zones. So this is a beefy, armored creature, specifically built to fight three guys. <laughs> I did not tone it down for fire stat because he's one guy. I actually made it harder. I, I toned it up. And one of the things I really like about Quantum Hands is that you can do that because of the armor system where you're not screwed by any one-shot mechanics and the ability to resist death, heal maims at the cost of tags, like, it's going to suck. But one guy can definitely, well, not definitely, but one guy can make it through uh, a lot more than you would expect. Also, with words and casting magic, you never know what people are going to come up with. Like, he could escape, right? Or he could make a giant mudslide. You just never know. So I'm pretty comfortable throwing like unbeatable odds against players in quantum hands. And it's fun. I think it's fun. So he throws the dagger. It does two damage to three durability armor. No break, no effect. So the demon continues his rampage around the circle and lurches at you from D4 with pincers. Now the pincers have a status effect on hit. They're going to bind. And a bind in quantum hands has so many negative effects, I think it might actually need to be balanced. So you can't move the part that was bound. And as a result of that, attackers don't need to roll to hit it because it's immobile. Um, and also you can't use it. So if they bind your main hand, you can't swing your weapon, and they can attack your main hand for free. Which is... Devastating. 
in some circumstances. Also, you can't move away because they've got your arm. Now, to break a bind, you just do an opposed 1d6. And this does not cost an action unless it fails. So you'll see in this combat very often that Firestat will try to break the bind and then do an action if that succeeds. Um, the way I conceptualized it is that you just do it as part of what you want to do narratively. And admittedly, we got a little out of the narrative here. But preferably, it would be like, okay, I'm going to move to D4, right? And the beginning of that action would be, okay, I break the bind, and then I go, or you don't. Um, as a DM, my preference would be that you just express your intent and then we'll figure it out. But I understand from the player perspective, it's like, well, I need to know if I break the bind or not. So I think that the, the rules as written need to be tweaked to uh, support that a little better. To, to phrase it better so that we do figure it out first and then allow you to make an action. Okay, so the demon actually ends up getting a headshot with these, these pincers. And headshots are worse than leg shots for the player because the player's dead if his head just get, gets crushed, right? But an offhand arm? Whatever. Legs, pretty negligible. But head, head's kind of, kind of the end of it, right? So because of the cloth armor, his cloth head armor is destroyed, but not his head itself. Uh, but also he, his head is bound, so he can't move. Um, his head can get attacked for free. Like, this is a, a bad position to be in at the start of the boss fight. So he tries to break the bind. He rolls a two. The boss also rolls a two, but because skill checks and opposed checks in general are meet or beat, a two against a two, we're going to give it to the player. So he breaks the bind on his head, tears those pincers off, and then he's going to go for the staff strike, uh, which again is a d8, d10. So he rolls his d8, he gets a three, which is the leg zone. Now, at this point, I had not actually decided how I was going to handle the HP yet uh, for the two, the two zones. As his head is facing Firestat, this damage should go to the head. I don't know that it does. He rolls three for damage. Your staff collides with several of his legs at once. The bony armor flakes off, and you can see a mortal body underneath. So at this point, I had actually applied the head zone damage to the legs, which is interesting. I didn't think I had done that. So the demon is going to get smacked, going to turn, and in turn he's going to butt swipe fire stat and then run the opposite way, right? Just kind of an about face. And he takes off running. His head's going to end up in D6. His tail's going to end up in D5. Firestat is going to move into D4, and he's going to throw a dagger. I think he's tired of getting grabbed already. And so he's going to aim for the head. Uh, D8 on range, great. So he hits a 3, and then for damage, he rolls a 3 as well. So it's on a D4. It's not a bad roll. It for like the goblins, three, for example, was enough to take them out of the fight completely to kill them. Uh, bosses are usually a little tankier, a little tougher. Three is enough to break some armor, you know, to at least get through that. You crack away his bony face to reveal a blue crystal encrusted into his face. Use the word face a lot. But yeah, so his head armor has now been shattered and you can see the blue crystal that we came here for. Um, yes, there are some similarities to other popular media, but that's not really the point here. Not really what we're doing. So he continues his rampage to D2 and D1. Firestat decides he's going to cast a spell on the demon. We're using the words electric and longing. I'm hoping to calm this dude down with some sort of electric therapy that'll make him wish for something in his past or some such. Now that's very specific player intent. That is exactly how I want spells to work in court. You've got two words, and you're going to use these two concepts to create a magical effect and just 
narratively explain it, and then we're going to figure it out rules wise. So I, I paused for like a solid 30 seconds on this. I thought, like, is there any way to make this spell work and respect the lore? Because <laughs> I know all about demons. You don't know all about demons, but I know all about demons. And I'm like, Ugh, could I have the, the heroes that make up the body of this demon do something to debilitate them? Could I in any way justify <laughs> letting electric longing have an effect. I just couldn't. So, unfortunately, the spell was wasted. lost two words for nothing. But, <laughs> we moved on very quickly. So, he moves into D6 and he ends his turn. Sometimes spells fail. Um, in this case, it was lore reasons. I loved the idea of the spell. I thought it was fantastic. I really wanted to make it work. I tried to make it work, but just lore-wise, it couldn't. So he wants to move into D6. We realize that there's a discrepancy between my map and his map. And being the fantastic player that Firestat is, he decides to just be like, okay, I'm totally fine with going with what you have. You're probably right. I'm probably wrong. Um, I was totally fine to go with what he had, but we didn't waste a ton of time on it. We just picked one and went. And that is what I love from a game is like when we can just agree that it is, it is not the most important thing that makes me happy. Now, admittedly, we're like two and a half hours into the game at this point. He's been with me for a while. I don't think either of us expected the test game to go on as long as it did. He ends the turn in D5. The boss is still in D2 and D1. So he's going to continue his charge around this ring, and he's going to go for another pincer. Firestat knows that if he keeps getting grabbed, he's going to die. Uh, the pincers get his legs. His cloth pants are destroyed. Okay, so Firestat wants to break the bind, and he's got a creative idea on how to get a bonus for it, right? Because he knows he needs to get out of this bind. His legs are crucial. So the boss rolls a two which should be easy enough to break. But Firestat continues with his idea. He says, can I use parkour to finagle my way out of his grip and onto his head? I'm like, well, that's, that's a great idea. You know, that's fantastic. So I say, yeah, I'll give you, I'll give you 1d6 to break for that, like using your, your words to kind of sneak out, right? And so he rolls 2d6, a 3 and a 2. It's a good thing that he rolled um, so then I ask him to clarify, like, what, what do you mean, like, onto his head? He's like, I'm going to ride this motherfucker. Firestat didn't say motherfucker, but it was the intent, right? So he climbs up on the boss's head, and he just dagger stabs to get, like, a grip on this guy. And at this point, I'm like, I was unprepared for this eventuality, like, I don't know why I didn't plan for someone to ride my boss, but here we are, right? Here we are riding the boss with a dagger in its head. And I need to adjudicate the rules here. Like the fuck. <laughs> so I say, you'll need an empty hand. Cause like, that's what the, this is what the binding rules require, right? An empty hand. So you're just going to grapple this huge guy, right? Rules-wise. And uh, so he says, okay, so after I escape the demon's clutches, I flip over the top side of its pincers and drive a throwing knife into its head to try and hold on to it when it tries to move away. I'm basically trying to ride it like a horse or like the Colossi in Shadow of the Colossus. I'll drop my staff to keep a free hand open. Now this... This is a ballsy move, right? Because you haven't even really made it through the armor yet, like a little bit, but you're going to drop your 1d10 weapon, knife this guy in the head and just ride him. Well, he doesn't have a backup weapon. He isn't throwing knives. So we're, we're going to try to land a melee attack. The only thing he would have failed on is a five. And I was, I was praying for a five because I don't, I don't know what to do with this situation. 
So I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, dog. So he does one damage. I use this opportunity to uh, describe how the dagger goes into the flesh of the demon to kind of like reiterate, like, you made it through the armor. This thing is killable. You just have to do damage. Uh, as you've previously sheared off his head's bone plating, the knife slides smoothly in and you have a firm grip on the beast. You won't stop him from moving, but you'll go where he goes without incident. And Fire Set says, nice, just what I was aiming for. So I feel like I'm doing okay at this point. So I also know that I, I don't know what Fire Stat's endgame is here, right? Like, you're going to ride this demon until... You're going to ride him to... Like, where are you going with this? I have no idea. So I figure... I give him some time to figure it out. So I say, he does not appreciate this, and begins thrashing and wailing. The awkward yelp begins deep in his belly and echoes out his jaws. He rampages to D8 and D7, searching for relief. And his turn. So he does nothing for a turn, effectively. And Firestat's only action is hang on tightly. So now I'm caught in this, this awkward loop where it's like, okay, I gave you a turn to like show me where you're going with this, and you hang on tightly. So if I do another turn, will you continue to hang on tightly? And so I decide I, I need to get out of this as a DM. I've, I've crossed the line into, like, death spiral territory. So his body begins to scrape along the old stone walls, breaking off pieces and flinging bone in every direction. This goes on much longer. Your two exits may be lost. Firestat, being the fantastic player that he is, takes the hint and says, okay, I'm, I'm going to get off the demon now. That was rad, but I'm going to get off the demon. So I let him land safely in C4, no penalty for getting back to the game. Uh, so he's going to move one cell away and throw another knife at the head of the demon. 1d8, 1d4, he rolls a 5, which is a miss. And then he wants to know where his staff is. Because he realizes, no weapon. So that is still in d5, where he dropped it. So the boss's rampage finally concludes, and he rears up in D1. This is not a mechanic I thought about. This is not any plan that I had. I'm just like, okay, we need to not ride the demon. <laughs> that was really like my primary motivation for changing things was like the dynamic of this fight needs to change. So what I did was I had the boss stop taking up two spaces. He's going to take up one space, which is going to fix my hit zone issue as well. Like we're just going to bring it all into one. And then, also, I was realizing that Firestat does not have all the pieces of the puzzle to claim a decisive victory. So I wanted to give him, like, more words to play with, right? Like, maybe there'd be a spell in there somewhere. Because the whole time I was expecting Electric Moon to, like, just zap my guy to death. But, uh... So I, I'm going to bring in the Undead Miners that he skipped before. I'm going to do a little callback here. So his rampage concludes and he rears up in D1. You see the flashing dim light coming down the D8 tunnel. The end of the turn. So Firestat grabs another knife and chucks it at the demon. This is one move, which is a fine move, but... It did get a little samey because we kind of got out of the narrative. We did kind of get into the mechanics of the battle, um, which is not what I would rec recommend. Keeping it all narrative and using the rules if necessary. But test game, what are you going to do? And it was at this moment that I decided that the previous writing of the demon needed to have a positive effect. Fireset needed to get something out of it and be rewarded for getting off the demon. So we stripped all the armor of the boss, which made sense with the narrative. So that two damage went directly to HP. Now, each zone of the centipede had eight HP. Like, it's a lot of HP. Uh, because it's spread out across multiple zones, right? Like, eight here, eight here, eight here, eight here. So if you do two damage to this one and one damage to this one, you've effectively done nothing, right? <laughs> it, it can be very frustrating. 
one thing that makes crits so important, right? Uh, the light grows closer. You suspect they'll arrive after your next turn. The demon slowly circles and returns to upright, occupying only C1. At this point, I place the tokens for the upcoming enemies outside the zone that they'll join. Uh, I do forget that Firestat can't see my board at this point, so that was actually kind of not that productive. But I put them outside of D7. Um, so they're going to come in one at a time because undead only get one action a turn. Um, and they're going to not do much, right? Like they're undead. They're supposed to die really fast and not do much. So the goal was to give fire at word pinatas that would just help him end this fight or escape it at least, right? Because it, the line between life and death in quantum hands is both very, very thin and very, very wide. But there's cost. We're throwing daggers. <laughs> He's losing legs, but he got a ways to go. As long as I can stop him from moving around so freely, I can start going to town on him with the staff once I pick it up. True, but you're also in the small ring with him now. So the thing about the rings on the battle board is that they, they change the pacing of things. On the inner rings, you can get around very fast. But... You are open to many attackers. And it just it changes on what ring you're on, how fast you can get around, what your ranged options are, how many attackers can hit you, how well you can flank other zones, um, how protected you are by your allies. There's a lot to consider. And in this case, uh, basically, if the boss starts rampaging again, he's going to have a real problem on the C ring because, like, you know, he'll hit you every single turn. <laughs> he doesn't have to charge all the way around D8, right? The undead miners come in, and they have pickaxe. Now, I did not pick a pickaxe for the balance of the pickaxe. I picked the pickaxe because they're miners. Um, you can see the flicker of light of his comrade close behind. The demon moves into C2 and goes for another pincer. So this demon is not, he's not rampaging. He's just kind of... You know, doing centipede stuff and then going for the the chomp. So now the miner enters into D8, and the demon moves into C2 and goes for another pincer. Uh, three damage to the offhand, and it is bound. At this point, there's some discrepancy about how much HP a character starts with, because in version 2 of the rules, I wrote one thing, and then I corrected it, and then I lost the document. And I can't remember which was the original, which was corrected. So either... All the zones have four, or the head has four, or six, and the rest have four. It's, I don't know what the correct starting HP is. I had a really good reason when I wrote it down, and then I lost it. And I, I have not solidified my thinking on it yet. So I believe what we went with for this game is that the head has four and all the others have six but I, I don't think that is correct. Good guy Firestat rolled with it. So he took three actual damage to his offhand out of six. So his offhand is halfway dead, which is spooky when you think about losing an arm on a character, right? So he's going to break the bind and move into the D-ring. So the boss rolls two, Firestat rolls five, easy peasy. That moves into d5 after uh, breaking the bind. Undead Miner 1 moves from d8 to d7. The other one enters into d8. Again, they only get one action a turn. They're not that spooky. The demon uh, snakes around and curls into d2. So he crosses the ring, which takes extra movement. It's clear that he is going to start charging. Now, at this moment, I decided that he's only going to charge on the D-ring and make it seem like it was intentional the whole time. There was a mechanic there. just had to move in or something. Um, I, I don't think it mattered. I don't think I needed to decide that. I just did. So Firestat finally picks up his staff and throws a dagger at the demon. Now, I have mixed feelings about how we handled switching weapons in this combat. Because this is kind of the, the prime example of like, 
I pick up my staff and I throw a knife is probably fine. Like, I have no narrative objection to it. But should there be an action requirement to hold a two-hand weapon and use a ranged action? Or use a ranged weapon? I don't know. We need to explore it more deeply. So, Firestat rolls a five on that throw. So normally a five is a miss. But because the demon is in one, one space, he's got an extra hit zone that occupies that five hit zone. So in this case, the five is a hit. He rolls two damage, and we keep rolling. So the miners just slowly shamble and circle around to d6 and d7. Fire stats in d5, he's totally safe. And the demon's up in d2. So currently, there is no threat to fire stats. However, the demon begins to charge to pincer you again. Five damage to your legs, and you're bound. So, five damage to the legs that have six HP is going to be a problem for our boy. So, Firest is going to break the mine and strike at the demon with his staff. Three to break the mine, six. So, he breaks the mine, and then he rolls five for the attack. Unfortunately, the demon had begin to, begun to charge. So he's occupying two spaces again, D4 and D3. So that five is not a hit this turn because he's not occupying one space anymore. And this is what I mean when I say I did not tone it down for fire stat in that I could have very easily been like, oh man, five's a hit. But that, that's not, it's not the truth, right? The truth is that he's occupying two spaces. That's a miss. And the miner moves into d6 because fire set's bound he can't run away so to break the bind the boss rolls a three fire stat rolls a six so he's free and he attacks with the five uh, the miner moves into d6 and he's got a pickaxe which is two-hand weapon so it's going to be a d8 d10 he rolls a seven he misses fortunately because fire stat is in a pickle now, there are flanking rules. The miner could spend a whole turn flanking with the demon to get bonus rolls, but he only gets one action per round. I kind of juggled over this for a minute to decide, like, should they be allowed to flank if they only get one action per turn? And I decided no, they shouldn't. So they didn't. I didn't think it made sense for Undead to be flanking with a demon. So the demon then uh, decides to go for more bites. He hits zone two and does one damage, which just happens to be the exact number of armor that Cloth is, on Firestat's main hand. So at this point, I believe all of Firestat's armor is gone. His legs are one damage from being broken. His offhand is three damage from being broken. He's in a bad spot. He's also bound because of the bite. So... Not looking great for our hero. Firestat's going to again try to break the grip and hit him with the staff. He rolls a 2 for breaking the bind. The boss rolls a 6. So this is the first time that Firestat has failed to break the bind. Um, so now he is held in place. He can't move his main hand. And <laughs> he's being flanked by a miner with a 1d10 weapon. So this is like pretty bad situation. Well, the miner's turn, the miner actually does roll. He decides not to just take the freebie main hand. And I was trying to give Firestat a break by doing that, but he quits. So <laughs> the miner gets to choose a zone, right? And I'm like, what zone would a miner choose? He's got to crit the head with a pickaxe, right? And he just happens to roll 10 damage. So just to reset the scene here, the demon has grabbed your arm, your main hand arm, your weapon arm, try to break it, it doesn't work. And then the miner just axes you in the friggin' head, pickaxes you, and you are dead. Now in quantum hands, you can spend tags, permanent tags to 
uh, resist death, fully heal. You don't repair your armor, but you do come back to life. And this is a major feature of Fate Weavers, which are major characters in the world. So not just players, enemies can do this too. Not in this story, but, you know, if you were trying to take out the Archduke, he could resist death five, seven, ten times. Um, it's a real problem. So Firestat has to make, like, a tough decision at this point, because you have to choose a tag. And the tags are the things that you chose to describe your character. Like, this is the basis of your character. And when you lose a tag, you have to roleplay the outcome of that. So if you are an elf and you lose Ageless, that's going to have a profound and lasting impact on all of your interactions in the world. Like, losing a tag is a pretty big deal. So Firestat decides to give up Greed, Greedy, and that is going to make him less human. Uh, he asked me, well, how do I roleplay that? I said, maybe you'll find out someday. <laughs> but that wasn't satisfying, right? So I had to give him more. Um, so he said, you no longer feel the human urge to build and to compete. Uh, you don't feel the need to have more. So building great cities, out of your way. All, all these things that you could want, you just don't really want as much anymore. Which seems minor, it's a role play thing, but it's it's also a pretty big deal for a lot of characters. So your HP but not armor is fully restored, your turn is spent. That's the other thing, it takes a whole turn to undie. And this boss was built for three people, so getting bound was not intended to be such a, a death situation, right? Like you you're meant to have allies that are going to help you like spread out the binds, but that's not what happened. He ended up going solo and being bad was a big deal. So he wastes his turn. Uh, it's the miner's turn again. He rolls a four, which is the offhand and he rolls a nine for damage. So because armor is not restored, he, just completely cleaves through Firestat's arm the turn after he cleaved through his head. Uh, you are able to use tags to heal individual body parts, but it's kind of not worth. Um, also, the demon does three damage to the main hand that he was already biting. So now his main hand is at half damage. His off hand is gone everything's exposed like he's in a bad state so firestead decides he's not going to heal this mate he's going to walk around with a busted offhand for a while which is totally reasonable i think i would do the same thing if i wasn't using a shield right a shield can be a big lifesaver so like it's kind of a, a toss-up there okay so he's going to try to break the bind and then attack if that's successful and because he is down to one arm he can only attack one-handed uh, probably should not have given him full damage with one-handed staff, two-handed weapon being used in one hand, but we gave him 1d6, 1d6, which is standard one-handed weapon damage. So he rolls a 3 for hit zone and 5 for damage. So he's hitting legs for 5, but he's hitting the hit, he's hitting the head zone, which at this point... I think I had properly moved over to always do head damage. Um, I know I had made that mistake a couple of times previously where I applied it to legs instead of head. It was a whole mess. Which is the problem with just, you know, making it up as you go. But I hit the head, which has only taken one damage so far from when he rode it with the dagger. So a total of six damage to the head so far. It's got two left, I believe. All right, so with the bind broken, five damage dealt, uh, breaking a bind is part of an action. So he still has an action remaining. And this is when we start talking about moving in between two rounds. Uh, so he wants to start moving to C3. And basically what happens is if you get hit for HP damage while taking a two-round action, 
you have to roll 1d6, and that number has to be higher than the HP damage that you took, or it's interrupted. Also, people can move in front of you, that sort of thing, that'll stop you. Uh, being interrupted does not cost you an action, it just cancels the action you were doing. So if he starts moving to C3 this turn, gets interrupted, next turn he won't be down in action. He'll just still be where he was. Uh, so he's going to try to do that, I think. Yes. The miner will swing at him. Zone 3. Leg. For 10 damage. His legs are broken. This miner is just absolutely pickaxing the crap out of him. Like, this is rough. One shot the head. One shot the arm. One shot the legs. It's rough. So, <laughs> in addition to these broken legs, the demon tries to grab him and fails, turns around and starts rampaging the other one. So, the demon's head is in D2, his body's in D3. We are in D4. Also, taking 10 HP damage, you cannot roll higher on a 1D6, so you are automatically interrupted. So he does not move to C3. So he just wants to take a swing at the zombie. He is annoyed. He is going to do 1d6, 1d6 on that zombie. He rolled 5, and he So he's crippled, right? No legs, no arm. Fighting with his bow staff, trying to get this zombie. We have a little talk about what broken legs actually means. And the truth is, I don't know. Firestat intuitively thought it meant that he couldn't move. I think a maimed zone is not necessarily removed. I think it's just not usable for most actions, right? Like, you can't kick a door down with a broken leg. You can't jump with a broken leg. But I think you can still move. I think you hobble, you limp, you know? I guess it depends how they're broken, right? Which is where the narrative comes back to be the most important thing. Uh, so, at this point, Minor 2 is going to uh, start closing in, reacting to his previous movements, and start shambling towards C4 to try and cut him off, but it's a zombie, so he's super slow, right? Previously, this zombie has just done nothing, right? He's just been over in D7, chilling out. So, Minor 1 is going to swing again. Uh, three and nine so what happens when you hit an already maimed zone is that the damages are automatically diverted to head hp um, so in this case he takes nine nine damage. he's dead he's dead again and at this point i gave him the opportunity to just you know if you if you want to be done with this quest if you are at all annoyed with the situation also at this point we are three and a half four we're four hours in to this quest at this point and fire stat is hanging in there like a champ and i tell him like hey you you've died twice in this fight it doesn't seem to be going your way if you want to throw in the towel that's totally cool with me i appreciate you testing and his only response is collector sacrificed never give up never surrender so this guy bounces back, having given up his most important character tag. Like, he is a collector. That's the essence of the character. And he just gives it up to get back in the fight. I respect it. So the demon's rampaging to D8, right? One of these directions. <laughs> uh, he... The, like, the miners are in the way, right? So he's got to go over there. He's got to turn around to come back. Uh, his head ends up in D1. His body's in D8. And next turn, he's going to continue pincering. Like, that's just what's going to happen. So Miner 2 completes his move to C4. Miner 1 swings again, but he gets a 7. Thankfully. Like, I did not expect this miner to be a friggin' pickaxe sniper. Which maybe I should have. Maybe miners are pickaxe snipers. In resisting death, you're fully healed except for your armor. So he's got both his arms back, his legs are working again. 
heads fully healed. Eierstadt is ready to like turn this around. So he swings at the miner. Uh, gets a two, which is a main hand. Pickaxe arm. And he deals four damage. Zombies are like fragile, so he goes down with just the four. Pickaxe falls to the floor. And uh, <laughs> as a last hit bonus, because you get a word for every last hit, you get slash. And this is where <laughs> his pool of words um, is rather obvious how this will end. So <laughs> we'll, we'll just we'll continue and not talk about it. All right, so fire set moves to D6. And the miner in C4 starts moving back to D7. Because I had decided that this miner was going to respond to whatever Firestat did the previous turn to kind of get that feeling of like being slow and shambly. Yeah, so the demon rampages. He's in D4 and D3. Our hero is in D6. So he's going to move back into D5. and He's going to confront the demon with a spell. I'll just read verbatim what he posted to me. Move back into D5, and we combine moon and slash. The image of a crescent moon imposes itself over the demon before an ethereal blade of foreign origin slashes over the demon, tracing the shape of the moon. Because of historian, I know that it's a sort of eastern descent, which just fantastic. This is exactly what this entire system was built for. This moment right here. I could not love this more. Unironically. Like, it's memey and it's funny, but it's also exactly what I wanted. So, basically the effect of that is that I'm just going to let him hit. I'm just going to let him hit head zone because it's facing him. And he used two words to cast a spell. And I'm, it's two-handed weapon. I'm going to let him roll d10. Now, I know that the demon only has two head HP left. Okay. Firestat doesn't know that. So I let him roll a d10, and he rolls a 3. I'm like, oh man, what are the odds? So he severs this demon's head with a moon slash, and it is glorious. <laughs> and now we're both expecting the, uh, the zombie to anticlimactically just gank him at this point. But uh, he manages to take him out with an easy-peasy throwing knife. Um, yeah. So at this point, he, he's pretty done for the day, right? The moon slash, we're not going to beat that. And walking back to town is just kind of a waste of everyone's time. So he, he uses teleport and solve to teleport to a school, and I just let him have it because we're done. It's been five hours. And yeah, so that is pretty much how the first quest of Quantum Hands Season 1 has gone. It was awkward and stumbly and absolutely glorious. Firestat did a great job, and I really appreciate both his participation in the testing and letting me share this with everyone. So if you'd like to join a quest in the future, there is a quest board. I'll put the link in the description, I guess. Uh, yeah. uh, the system is working how I want it to. There are tweaks that need to be done. So I need to figure out starting HP is one of the big ones. Um, the 1d6, one difficulty challenge, I don't know what to do with that. I'm kind of fine with it. Switching weapons, so having the staff and throwing throwing knives, I need to figure out if that's, if that's legit or not. I, I don't know what to do there. Um... There's been some request for like an index of both words and specific weapons and armors, and I'm hesitant to do that because I think limiting the word selection kind of defeats the purpose. And the purpose is to think of things I didn't think of, right? So oh, I I didn't I didn't finish the quest, right? So I told you I would tell you what truth that Walther Wolfram asked for. Uh, so he gets back to the guild and he turns in the crystal 
and he's like, uh, the aviary representative is there and waiting. He's a full-on bird man wearing a white and gold robe. He thanks you for your efforts, hands you a guild coin, and asks what truth you would know. With the want to find rare objects gone, and the need to compete also missing. The usual answer of a relic's location just didn't seem to matter anymore. Another purpose in life, with nary a word, Walther will turn away from the guildmaster. The quest had changed his life forever. So, in the end, we lost the collector tag, which was kind of like the main driving purpose of the character. Um, so we survived, but the character is fundamentally changed. Like he didn't even care about the reward once he got it. Now, the guild coin could be valuable, but I think Firestad did a great job of role-playing the last 10 seconds of this quest. Yeah, I can't wait to go again. And he's accepted a quest and needs party members. So join up.